William from Exploding Word Ministries. I'm noticing that my light source here has somewhat changed, but I still want to be able to have this free discussion with you because my purpose today is to simply talk to you about Jesus Christ and our need to have Him in our lives. So I, I'm not so much referring to a Bible study at this particular juncture. What I want to do is simply discuss Christianity and how it affects us on an individual level. To start off with, I suppose, we need, to, we need to begin with the concept of who we are in Christ. The first thing is to understand that as the bride of Christ, that sometimes is a concept that we have great difficulty with because we don't fully appreciate what it means to be the bride of Christ. We are to inherit with him all things and to become joint heirs with him in all things. So that's an awkward way sometimes of putting things across. So let's, let's go back to the very beginning. Let's look at why this is important and how this relates to us. The first thing that we need to understand is that when God is trying to bring across to us spiritual things, he only discusses it with us from the point of view of our understanding, what we can understand. So to do that, he established within our societies and in every single culture in the world the concept of family. Now, the principle behind the concept of family is that by being part of a family, we reflect the fullness of God's character and nature and how he represents himself. In Genesis 1 we discover that when God determined to make mankind he made a declaration he said let us that is plural because he was using he the word describing God here is called Elwin meaning more than one consistency or a unit a easy simple explanation to it would be to use the term family um, and what God said is let us make man in our image now sometimes we have difficulties here and people say well isn't God just one isn't there just one God and yes there is here in Sescanor where I live there is also only one Andrews family there's a number of other families out there who have different names and some of them have are different families but have the same surname but here there's only one family which is called Andrews. So we could say that while the family consists of a minimum of four, father, a mother, two daughters, one of the daughters has got married and has brought another person into that family. Now because she married him, she's taken on his name. So she's no longer called Andrews. She's now called by her married name. But she's still part of the family. She still interacts with the family. And that's basically what God's talking about when he uses this term family and when he, used, when he created Adam and Eve as a family to reflect him. Because that's basically what Christianity is at its core. It's a family relationship. We are children of Almighty God. We were created to have a family relationship with Him and He is our Father. You might say, well, if He's a Father, do we have any other brothers and sisters? Well, of course, we, we, we have approximately seven billion in the world today, but they're all estranged from us. In other words, we, we don't have close family ties to them. But we do have an elder brother and that elder brother is Jesus Christ. He is off that original family unit, but the difference is he also is related directly to us. He's our older sibling. And it's, it's, it's God's intention that we inherit with him. Now, the inheritance is split culturally when a family inherited the children, there was an equal split made for everybody. So if you had three children, you would have been broke, you would have split the inheritance 
four ways. Now, you say, but you've only got three children, why four ways? Well, the situation was that the eldest son would inherit two portions of, of the inheritance, of, of the thing, because responsibility fell upon him to maintain the family name and the direct lineage of, 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 of the family. So, because this was important, a special uh, dispensation for him to inherit twice was given. And as a result, everyone else inherits one portion. But everyone inherits. Even the girls inherited if there was no ill male heirs to inherit in their place. Now, if there was a male heir, then the females wouldn't inherit because they would be married into other families and inherit with that family's inheritance. So it's a simple, simple concept of what things were being done there. But interestingly, and what we really need to understand is that when God posed this relationship with us, He wants us to be able to inherit all that He has. Now, the inheritance of God is this earth. This, this beautiful earth in which we live is what we are to be given. Now you might say, well, can we? we already have it, don't we? I mean, aren't we responsible here? Well, no. We're in a situation at the moment where we live on the earth, but we're more of the earth than inheritors of it. No, we're part of the earth. We're part of the creation at the moment because we're created out of the dust of the ground. We haven't yet reached the point where we will be changed and become more a reflection of God than we now are. Now, in that we were made in the image of God and in that we reflect God, we're not very good at that. We look like God, man, woman, child of every culture and every language and nation that's on the earth today look like God. We have a genealogy that is similar we are genetically compatible with each other. We are of the one set of parents. And that's the wonderful thing, because we can tell you who they are, Adam and Eve. But while we all have come from Adam and Eve, and while we, all the races, all the peoples of the world today, all seven billion approximately of them, they all have one other thing in common. And that is that they all have the potential to have a relationship with God the Father. And it's that relationship with God that we need to discuss, that we need to talk about, and that we need to look at. Because this is the most important thing that we can have, is a relationship with our Heavenly Father. But in order for us to have that relationship, we have to be restored into a position where we can have a relationship. I'm going to look at things slightly different today because I want to bring across something which is a little different and I need you to bear with me as we go through this. In the Bible you will notice that it has often been said that God rejects all forms of witchcraft and divination and also mediums. In other words, you're not to consult with the dead. Now, while we understand the concept of that, we have to understand that in every single thing that God has spoke that we're not to do in the concept with outside of our religious practices, we are to do it through Christ. And now that sounds a bit strange, but consider this. Anciently God used the office of a prophet to foretell the future and to give advice directly from God to the people. The office of prophet is the same equivalent to a seer, or, or a, in fact, we're called seers, or an oracle, what's the word called. But it was the individual had the ability to speak to spirits, in this case, God. Now, when it was used to speak to a demonic spirit, then it was 
disallowed because then you would be getting information that would be contrary to your well-being. So we understand that the, the Office of Profit is identical in its thing to being a medium or a witch because if you think about it what a prophet did was witchcraft they interacted in the supernatural so there's the first part that we need to understand we need to get our mindsets around this to understand that while we are not to use the fake means we have a legitimate reality of the real McCoy so our relationship with God is based on reality but there is a fake or counterfeit spirituality out there as well and that's what God is t warning the people about so when they would come into contact with foreign gods and foreign belief structures and mediums and contact and dead and all of this concept what they were doing was they were they were coming up across counterfeits of the real thing and that's the important thing God does not want us dealing with the counterfeit he wants us to deal with the real thing and that real thing is Jesus Christ so we need to understand that from God's perspective we as humanity are dead to him we can't have a relationship with God because spiritually we're cut off from him we've been separated by death and in the same way as within our physical lives when a person that we care about that we love cherish etc die we lose the ability to have a relationship with that person we remember them we, we can recall them but we can't talk to them we can't have a meal with them we can't share with them we could go to their grave yes but it's not the same because we know that they cannot hear us where they cannot have an interaction with us and that was God's position with us he knew we were there he understood everything about us but it was impossible for God to enter into communication with us because we were dead but it was necessary for God to talk to us because how else could he speak life back into us? Therefore, he had to use a medium. A medium, for all ten purposes, is an intermediary. Someone who stands between two levels. Now, our intermediary isn't, as some believe to be, the law. No, our intermediary was called the Lucas, the Word of God the representative of God on this earth starting in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and working all the way up through the patriarchs, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob right up until we get to Moses and when the law is given and then through all the prophets until we get to John the Baptist. At this point the rules change because our mediator, the Logos, the Word of God, becomes flesh and dwells among us. And that is Jesus Christ. So Jesus, who is our mediator, now is in a perfect position to mediate properly between the Father and us. And he does this, he does this through the fact that he is both man and God. He shares both our strengths and both our weaknesses. Now, while he is here on the earth for the 33 and a half years approximately that he lived upon the earth before his crucifixion, he diversed, divested himself of all his hum of all his godly powers. In other words, when Jesus committed, when Jesus performed a miracle, or or a healing, or cast out a demon, or raised the dead, he did not use his authority as God to do that. He used his authority as the Son of Man. In other words, the Son who hadn't sinned. In other words, it was the same authority that was originally given to Adam, which Adam lost to Satan when Satan claimed it upon Adam's spiritual demise. 
So there is a change of aspect here. But Jesus, being alive, having a relationship with the Father, was able to walk in that power and authority and exercise it over Satan. Because Satan could not take it off him. It was his legal right to use that. Now, let's go into the next aspect of this because we need to understand. Because Jesus is our medium, strange using that word for Jesus, isn't it? As our medium, he's able to interact with the dead that he is associating with, namely everybody that's of the flesh. He talks to the disciples, he talks to the Pharisees, he talks to the sinners. He makes no difference between them and them because they're all spiritually dead. They're cut off from God. They can't have this relationship with God. So he starts by explaining to them that the only way they can get to God is through him. It's within his role as the medium, the mediator, the, the one who stands in the middle. And it's through him that we have this access to God. But Jesus is not going to be here for a prolonged period of time because God wants to make a permanent repair to us. He wants us to have this relationship to him through Christ on a permanent basis. To do that, he wants therefore to exchange our death for Christ's life. In other words, Jesus takes on our death and bears it on our behest. That we might receive his life and be restored to God. Now, the medium is you. If you're a Christian and you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are now alive before God and have access to the throne of God. But the world around you is dead. The world around you experiences death on a day-to-day -day basis. They're cut off from God. God means nothing to them whether they are aware of it or not. So they can't hear God directly, but they can hear you because you're part of their lifespan. You're part of their creation. And you can hear God because the life of God is also in you. So therefore, you're now, you now have become the mediator, the one who stands along with Christ because Christ's in you. you. You are his representative on earth. You stand as his representative in this job of mediating between the living, that is God, and the dead, that is the world. So, as we say on our website, we have a loving God who preaches acceptable words to this dead world that they might live. We have a God who wants them to live. His love for them and concern for them is without question. Now, the interesting concept, the thing that we really do need to come to terms with and understand, is our role in this. You might say, well, how are we equipped to be able to represent Jesus Christ? Well, this is the point. Physically, you're not. Physically, you're exactly in the same boat, position, whatever way you want to use it, as anyone else out there. But the difference is that the spiritual concept of you has changed. There is a new spirit in you and that spirit is the spirit of Jesus Christ. It was given to you so that you could be alive. So you now have Christ living in you and because Christ's life is in you and his life was perfect, you are unable to affect his life because it, it's not yours. It, it, it's been lent to you on a temporary basis for as long as you're here. And you can't affect it. So when you transgress, you can't kill that life. It stays alive in you. But because that life's in you, God can send his Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit's job is to come and join with the living being who is Christ. And when joined with the living being, intermediary between God, the link between God and man has been secured. Through the Holy Spirit, we can find and know the heart of God, how God thinks about things, and what He is saying. 
And that's part and parcel of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit which, which I use is the communication gifts. In other words, God speaks through his Spirit and it's that concept of why I preach. He tells me, now, it's hard to explain this. I don't want to get you confused. I don't hear voices. No. I mean that when I'm speaking, there, my thoughts are changing all the time and God pours into my understanding different concepts that he wants me to bring across. So I automatically just speak as he leads and directs. That's why these may seem somewhat disjointed because what we're actually doing here is just allowing the Spirit free access to use us. Now, that's fine. But remember, because we're not scripted, we're not going back, my, my disabilities, if you like, in that I can't always recall where things are in the scripture it means that I'll tell you this thing, I'll tell you all about it, but I don't necessarily tell you where it is because the Spirit doesn't necessarily tell me where it is. There's an expectation on us to know our scripture, to know what we're talking about. I can go and look it up later. You can go and look it up later. There's no problem there. That's not a difficulty. I might even be able to incorporate it into some of the telecasts. You know, put up an, a little bit of writing at the bottom. This is Matthew blah 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 or Luke wah blah blah. <laughs> the situation is though, we can put in the scriptural verses where it is and what it's about. That's not a problem. But when we're actually allowing the Spirit to speak through us, it, it, it's a continual concept. We're, we're allowing God access. And that's, that's mediumship. That's, that's exactly the same of what the Victorians would have looked at when they had this concept where they would raise the dead and speak to them. And it's also what we come across in the Bible when Saul, cut off from God, wants to speak to Samuel, who is now dead, and realizes that the only way he can do this is by using a counterfeit, an illegal means of accessing spiritual information. And he uses a witch. She's the witch of Endor. You will find the story in Second Samuel and understand this. What's happening in this particular story is that Saul, at his wit's end, wanting to know the outcome of a battle and what's going to happen, determines to raise the influence, the spirit, the life of Samuel again from death so that he can ask him a question. He needs to know something. He wants his advisor back because he's been cut off from God and the absence of God in his life means that he's literally a handicapped king. But the spirit that is brought up is a demonic spirit and it tells it tells Saul that he and his sons are to die in this battle. It doesn't it doesn't say anything else other than you are gonna die. Because that's exactly what's gonna happen. It's not lying to him, but it's not showing the love and concern that Samuel would have shown. And the cons and, and the way Samuel would have put someone across differs in this encounter. So we recognize that what Saul has done is he has interacted with a spiritual counterfeit and by getting that counterfeit, yes he's got the information which he didn't really want, but he got it in such a way where there's no love, there's no concern for him, there's no concern for his family or, or the relationship between David and Jonathan, there's none of that. There's just the stark reality that he's going to die. And he does, exactly as it was said. We're not that type of mediums. We have the Spirit of God in us. And therefore, as the Spirit of God is in us, the influence of God is supposed to direct our lives. So when people talk to us, we are to show the love and the concern of Christ to that individual. Now, 
sometimes you get Christians that don't do that. You, you get Christians who basically don't reveal the love or concern of Jesus Christ in how they approach things. And when you see that, when you get that aspect, you become aware of the fact that uh, there's something missing. And what's missing is the direct relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is portrayed within the family relationship by the wife or mother in the relationship. So I know that people have great difficulties to say, no, God can't be female. But God's not male either. <laughs> Do you understand? It's hard to get this sometimes because we're stuck in stereotypes. God's neither male nor female. But when he created mankind, he created us male and female. And the separation of our roles, the separation of how we come together in these things, all has to do with what he, in other words, it reflects him more fully. The role of the wife and mother is reflected, is a reflection, get it the right way around, William, of the Holy Spirit's role in our lives. Because the Spirit doesn't search out itself. It doesn't promote itself. But it searches out the things of God and brings it to us. The Spirit is a comforter. The Spirit is a counselor. The Spirit guides us, directs us, helps us, supports us. Sound like a wife? Like a mother? Yes, of course it does. Because that's the role. The homemaker. The motherly instincts. All of this is reflected by the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about having this relationship and the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us, you have to understand that there is a love there, there is a concern, there is an outward compassion. This is one of the reasons why we're told about the sin against the Holy Spirit, that is the rejection of the Holy Spirit in your life, as being an unpardonable sin, because this Spirit's concern is solely and completely for you. Nothing else. There is no personal personal helper or support to the Spirit itself. It's only, the Spirit's only for you and only concern for you. When we have difficulty praying, when there's times we want to talk to God about something but we just don't know how to bring it across, the Spirit intercedes for us. You see, have you ever, I don't know, have you ever as a child needed to speak to your dad? You've done so. You know you've done so. you got to tell him. But how do you tell him? Uh, he might go through you for a shortcut. That's a Northern Ireland expression, meaning he just isn't happy. But you don't know how to do it. But your mother has become aware of your concerns and your problems. She says, look, it's all right. I'll forward it. I'll talk to you. I'll sort it out. That's, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. If you think that you go through life as a Christian and you never make a mistake, think again. <laughs> we all make mistakes and we all get ourselves the wrong way around it. And that's part and parcel of the problem too. So when the Holy Spirit interacts on our behalf, the Holy Spirit is interacting to ensure that our relationship with God is always kept to the best possible way. We mediate on behalf of our fellow mankind here on the earth but the Holy Spirit mediates on our behalf continually that mediation process is happening so while we're spiritually alive through Jesus Christ we don't need a medium to talk to God we talk to God directly but we do sometimes need someone to just speak on our behalf and that's where the Holy Spirit comes in but when anyone in the world wants to address God, say you have an individual who comes to you and says, I need prayed for. You must understand, and this is a hard thing to understand, they do not have access to the Father in Heaven. They have to go through a mediator. Do you remember the story of Job? Job had three friends. His three friends were as religious and understanding of all the things around about as Job was. They were basically all cut from the same cloth of their era. The problem is when 
Job's life fell apart because of Satan's influence and destructive nature to try and cause Job to fail before God. His friends automatically assumed he's doing wrong. Well. And instead of being support, they're criticizing. But God has a relationship with Job that he doesn't have a relationship with his friends. So when God intervenes, when he addresses Job directly, he also addresses the three friends. And he tells them that they need to request Job to pray for them. In other words, God is basically saying to them in very direct things, I don't hear your prayers. I don't understand what you're on about. You have nothing with me. You need, you need Job to speak on, for your behalf. And then I will hear what he has to say about you. Jesus tells us the exact same thing. He reminds us that we do not have a relationship with God the Father. He reminds us that nobody was even aware that God the Father existed, neither the prophets of old, Moses, Abraham, or any of them, because they hadn't come to the point of understanding about the Father, because God wasn't dealing with the physical, he was dealing with the spiritual, and the problem was the spiritual died. There was a need for a mediator, one who could stand in the breach between man and God, and that one was the Logos, the Word of God, who would become the Son of God, who is also the Son of Man, who is Jesus Christ. You see, without Him, we go nowhere and we have nothing. With Him, we have a perfect relationship with our Father in Heaven. And it's that relationship that we continually have to remember, because His role has come to us. The Father has sitting at his right hand in heaven at the moment, Jesus, our resurrected Savior. Jesus stays there until he's sent back, as he told us. But in the meantime, when he is up there, we are down here. But we have his spirit, as he has our spirit, resurrected in his body, waiting up there in heaven with him in Paul refers to this throughout some of his letters, uh, Ephesians comes to mind, and he brings this across that we currently are sitting in heaven at the right hand of the Father in Jesus Christ because Christ is sitting in us down here on earth and that, that, that's the other concept of the story if you like. He is here, he is in us and because that's so important that we need to understand that. We need to come to terms with that one concept that true Christ, true Christ, we have this relationship with the Father. But we have it so that we can continue the work of Jesus Christ on the earth today until he comes back. Jesus told a parable of a man who left his estate in charge of his servants. And he went off to a foreign country to claim a kingdom for himself. While he was away, he commanded all his servants to trade until he returned. Now, a passage of time takes place, but then the king returns. Full power and authority. Now, before he left, there were certain individuals from the country in which he had lived who said, we will not have that man rule over us. And they sent a petition to the king that he was going to, to say, we do not want that man to have authority over us. And in Jesus' time, this, this story had very strong resonance of what was going on, because the Romans held sway over the whole of Judea, and many of the surrounding lands and nations as well. But each area needed to have a king and somebody to rule over it on behalf of Rome. So individuals would be chosen or would position themselves with Rome in order to gain access to the authority. Herod had done that. His sons had done that. This was a common practice. You could buy the concept of it. 
and people didn't often like the rulers they were being offered. As we know, they didn't like Herod. He was an Edomite. He wasn't even a Jew. <laughs> Just a difference of opinion. So Jesus, when he's bringing this across, is saying that this man also went, and there were people who were saying, look, we're not, we don't want him. Now, in the parable, he takes his estate and he separates it down and gives authority to his servants, who he has chosen, that they will undertake what he would have done had he been there. In other words, they take on the full management of his estate and his, his business. That's what Jesus did with us. He has given, first of all to the disciples, then to the wider church, and to the church throughout all the ages, this responsibility to carry on his work, that work he did while when, on, when he was on earth, in this earth today. And that involves teaching, preaching, healing, casting out devils, and raising the dead. So you see, none of these things have changed. They're all very much still active and still very much alive. It's gifts within the church and, and responsibilities of the church. So when we look at these things, we need to understand what our job is. It's to carry the fullness of Christ in all things to all people. I just wanted to get that across. You and I are mediums. Mediums of Christ. We stand in his position of power. That in all things, we might become one with our Father in heaven. It is God's desire. It is God's desire that you and I inherit life. It's God's desire that we continue the work of Jesus Christ in everything that we do. And so with that in mind, I'm just going to close this portion of our talk. We will be coming back to other things later. So until the next time, Godspeed.